Okay, first, you've got to give me some props on the photography here. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's not Ansel Adams, but uh, there's a real story behind this. I wanted to get this picture, and so uh, it took about an hour to get it on a clammy, cold, drizzly, atypical Southern California night in the pitch black out on our patio. And as I say, it took about an hour, and what I ended up getting out of it were about two good shots and a pissed off wife. Uh, <laughs> I was the cameraman. She was the, uh, the food stylist, the prop girl, the production assistant, the, uh, uh, the intern, and the caterer. And she went out and got these marshmallows that were as big as a cat's head because she wanted to be able to see them. The problem is you couldn't light the things. So we had a fireplace going, so she had to run in the house, light the things in the fireplace, and come sprinting out into the patio, which is, you know, a long way away. And she would get out there, and I have a new camera, and so I'm fumbling with it in the dark trying to figure out how to do it to focus it, and just about the time I get focused, the marshmallow would fall off and splat. <laughs> and so we went through multiple iterations of that and finally got this picture, so it's uh, <laughs> a lot of effort. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, we're going to, the title of the talk is, uh, Does Fat Really Burn in the Flame of Carbohydrate? This is a, an old saying that's been around a long time, and it uh, is from an old German paper from 1906. And actually, uh, I've heard from some people that, that uh, Rosenfeld heard it from a guy named Hirschfeld that wrote a paper in, in 1895, I don't know. But this is the first time that uh, I know of it's being printed. And uh, Hans Krebs said that this was the first time, so I'll go with Hans. But anyway, you can read it. It's uh, pretty easy to translate. I'm not going to read the German. But it's that it, basically that fat burns in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the flame of carbohydrates. And if you, uh, if you look at this, here's how they figured this out back then. They took fat. I'm not sure that they ate a lot of avocados back in 1906, but they took fat and they realized that if they gave people only fat to eat, that they produced ketones. Now back then they couldn't measure beta hydroxybutyrate, they could only measure acetone and acetoacetone. And so it came out that these people were producing uh, ketones in their urine. If they fasted people, they got the same result. And of course, uh, when you're fasting people, they're eating their own fat, so they were on a high fat diet too. And then they discovered that if they added carbohydrates to the mix, that the uh, ketones went away. So they said, aha, fat is burning in the flame of carbohydrates because they thought ketones were just sort of partial breakdown products of, of fat metabolism. They didn't realize that ketones were actually an essential fuel and it wasn't until the 1960s in George Cahill's monumental studies that showed that ketones were really a fuel of respiration. Up until then, people thought that they were just sort of partial fat uh, breakdown products and kind of dangerous. So, if you look at the, the modern day textbooks, and I apologize for how crummy this slide is, but it's the best I could do. Uh, they say that the, the dependency uh, on fat to burn, uh, or I mean carbohydrates to burn fat, is the molecular basis of the adage that fats burn the flame of carbohydrate. Because they used to say it because they didn't really know what was going on. And now they say it because of the way the whole, uh, uh, um, Krebs cycle and glycolysis works. Now, if you take this cell, and I'm going to try to make this simple so no one will uh, confuse me with Ivor Cummins, but if you start out with, <laughs> if you start out with glycolysis, uh, you know, a molecule of glucose breaks down to a couple molecules of pyruvate, it goes across the mitochondria, it goes into the acetyl CoA pool, and it gets in there. And everything kind of goes through acetyl-CoA, through the acetyl-CoA pool. Even our friends, the ketone bodies, who weasel their way in through the acetyl-CoA pool. And if you look at this, you got the, the pyruvate goes into the acetyl-CoA pool, oxaloacetate, that's OAA, goes around, and the Krebs cycle churns around, and it churns off some, some high-powered electrons, a couple of NADHs on one side, and an NADH and an FADH2 on the other side. And these go into the, citri into the uh, uh, electron transport chain and go through oxidative phosphorylation. Now, while we're here, I've got a quiz. How many people recognize this guy? 
How many people recognize this guy? <laughs> well, the first guy's intellectual achievement, in my view, equals the second guy's. This guy, first guy is Peter Mitchell, and Peter Mitchell's kind of a weird guy. He's an Englishman. He's dead now. But he is the guy that single-handedly elucidated the electron transport chain in the, in the chemiosmotic theory, which is a, just a hellacious undertaking if you understand this thing. And he thought this up by himself when everybody else was looking the other way. And he was kind of a weird guy. He was up on the faculty of the University of Edinburgh, and he got in fights with the faculty members, and he was kind of a flamboyant guy because he had a lot of family money, and he ended up saying, to hell with it, I'm quitting academia, and he left. And then he thought about it, and he had been thinking about this whole electron transport thing, and he decided, no, nah, maybe I'm not going to do that. So he took some of <coughs> excuse me, his family money, and he bought Glen House, which is a, a big mansion down in Cornwall. He wanted to get as far away from Scotland as he could get, and this is down in the southern part of England. So he took and he uh, renovated this mansion with his family money, and he made this a lab, and in there he elucidated this whole electron transport chain, which is extremely complex, and it's just amazing that you could do it. And that's how the cell respires. When you talk about cellular respiration, that's it. You get 88, 89% of the energy from the cell through the electron transport chain, and nobody knows this guy. And when I was in taking college biology, we had a professor, and I can't even remember then how they taught uh, biochemistry and cell energetics. But I remember, <clears throat> I think I seen, you know, there's this crazy guy in England that's got a theory about this that's just totally nuts, but there's a chance he might be right. And he was right, and he, and he got the Nobel Prize for it. And so I wouldn't be me if I didn't leave you with a book recommendation. So you ought to get Wandering in the Gardens of the Mind. That's a biography of Peter Mitchell. Uh, great guy. Anyway, so infomercials over. We'll return to our regular programming here. <laughs> so we're, <laughs> we're back to the, uh, to the uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Phosphorylation. So beta oxidation is the breakdown of long chain fatty acids. Beta, oxygen, go, uh, beta oxidation sends two carbon chunks of fat basically into the acetyl CoA pool. And uh, pyruvate keeps on going. Now, pyruvate can actually jump in and help oxaloacetate a little bit if it needs to. Uh, if oxaloacetate is running low for some reason, and there's some reasons that it can run low because it, it makes other amino acids, and sometimes you need amino acids and it makes them, and those are not just the amino acids from oxaloacetate, but a bunch of other precursors of the Krebs cycle that are before uh, uh, oxaloacetate make amino acids, and if they make amino acids, they're not there to make oxaloacetate, so you can have a, a decrease in the oxaloacetate pool, and pyruvate helps uh, uh, take up the slack for that. Okay, now, let's say that all the pyruvate goes away, and we start with gluconeogenesis because we're on a low carb diet or we're fasting. And so you've, you've got to make sugar and you make it from oxaloacetate. So once again, that jerks it out of the Krebs cycle. So when it jerks it out of the Krebs cycle, the oxaloacetate can't condense with the acetyl-CoA uh, to go on around the cycle and throw out the, the high energy electrons. So what happens? Well, you replace it with some amino acids. That's one thing you can do. Amino acids, of course, are protein, and protein makes up your lean body mass, so you can lose some lean body mass. Now, you don't have to worry about this too much if you're eating a protein diet, with your, or eating protein with your low-carb diet, because they will replace uh, whatever you're taking for oxaloacetate, unless you're really low on protein, too, in which case you can have some lean body mass loss. And I'm going to show you this in just a second. Okay, now beta oxidation on a low carb diet, you're mainly burning fat, so you do a lot of beta oxidation. And because you do a lot of beta oxidation, you get a big acetyl CoA pool. And that acetyl CoA pool, a lot of people believe, is sort of the trigger for ketogenesis because you got to do something with it. It can't go into the Krebs cycle, so you got to do something with that, so you end up making ketones. And when you make ketones, we'll get gluconeogenesis out of the way there. When you make ketones, you first make HMG-CoA, uh, which is a, an interesting molecule, and the second step is that you make ketones. But HMG-CoA is an intermediate step in the synthesis of cholesterol, okay? And so if you go up there, you can make, uh, if you take this step from HMG-CoA to, <coughs> to mevalonate uh, and then on to cholesterol, you've made cholesterol with it. And if you are making a lot of ketones, 
kind of by mass action, you, you run the stuff down the ketone pathway and you don't make as much cholesterol. And that's why a lot of times you'll notice if you have overweight patients and they have uh, hyperlipidemia and you put them on a ketogenic diet, their cholesterol goes down even though they're eating a lot of fat because they're not making as much. And this HMG-CoA, the, the place between that and the, uh, the mevalonate is the place that the statins work. That's uh, that enzyme is HMG coenzyme A reductase, and that's what statins block. So you can kind of do your own statin things if you're making ketones because it, it pulls the ketones down there. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, every, time I, every time I did this, reviewed this talk, I forgot to bring that up, and that was my carefully encoded uh, <laughs> message. <laughs> the, you, you, can go on a, you can go on a ketogenic diet, believe it or not, that's all potatoes or all rice, as long as the calories are low. If you're not meeting your caloric needs, you're gonna end up burning fat, and you're gonna end up being in ketosis some of the time. So people say that, well, you can never go on a ketogenic diet that was all potatoes, but you really can if you keep the calories down enough. And I'm gonna show you a picture a little later of a person that this happened to. Okay, now people say, and, and one of the themes of this talk that I forgot to mention, I should have had one of my little drop down things. At the start is I wanna talk about how uh, kind of behind the times medical textbooks are. Because that textbook thing that I showed you about the, the fat burning, the flame of carbohydrate, that is from the most recent Berg medical biochemistry textbook. Now that's the textbook I used when I was in medical school a million years ago, but it was called Stryer then, and he's still on the, the list, but he's at the bottom of the list now. Uh, but it's now Berg, and that's the one that everybody uses. And it's unbelievable how far behind the times it is with a lot of this stuff. I mean, there's so much stuff going on with ketogenesis and ketogenic diets that knowledge is way jumped ahead of the textbooks. But what's really sad is a lot of this stuff was done back in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, and it still is not shown up in the textbooks. This medical textbook has one and a half pages on ketones and ketogenesis and has 12 pages on cholesterol. So, now people generally think that write textbooks that that acetyl-CoA pool that I told you about that was really big in that, that last slide, that that's kind of the trigger, but that's not necessarily the trigger. One of the triggers is the brain because if, if you're low on glucose, the brain has to have either glucose or ketones or a combination of the two, usually a combination of the two. Uh, and so the brain puts in a call for ketones now, it puts in the call to the liver because that's where the majority of them are made. And when, when the liver makes ketones, and this also is going to show you why ketogenic diets, people lose weight a little bit more than those. It's not, you know, the calorie is a calorie is a calorie deal. In ketogenic diets, you get more bang for your buck because you get a little bit more weight loss. And that's been shown in a number of studies. And people are, are you know, trying to deny that all the time. But this is one of the reasons that I think it happens because the brain demands uh, uh, ketones. The liver makes ketones, you get rid of a little of them in the breath and in the appropriately colored urine, but that's a, a minimal amount that you get rid of. But what really happens is because the, the brain's needs and the liver's needs are not coupled, the brain needs it and the liver has to produce it and in the process of producing it, it generates a lot of ATP and that's the energy currency of the body. And so what ends up happening, what the liver does when it produces all this ATP, it's got to get rid of it somehow. And so what it does is it runs, for example, it runs a lot of this through the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle, which is a shuttle that looks like that. And basically it takes one product and uses up a high energy electron to make another product and uses a lower energy electron to return it to the original product that was made. And in the process of doing that a couple of times, it burns up an ATP. But no real work is done because it would be like my putting 500 concrete blocks right here and then spending half the day carting them and stacking them down there and then bringing them from there back to here. At the end of the day, no real work's done. The concrete blocks are still here, but a lot of energy has been expended. And that's what happens in feudal cycling. It's kind of like the heart uh, is on a treadmill. I mean, it's going, but it's not going anywhere. And that's a way that, uh, that the brain's demands for ketones uh, kind of help create a metabolic advantage on a ketogenic diet. Now this whole thing with the glycerol phosphate, or the, the G3P shuttle, that's in all the biochemical textbooks, all the biochemistry textbooks, but they never correlate it with this. You have to look up obscure papers to find it or figure it out on your own. Okay, 
Now, here's my big bugbear. This is the thing I really want to get to. This is in the very brand new Berg book. It says animals cannot convert fatty acids into glucose. And it says when glycogen stores are low, why can't the body make use of fat stores and convert fatty acids into glucose? Because animals are unable to affect the net synthesis of glucose from fatty acids because acetyl-CoA cannot be converted into pyruvate or oxaloacetate in animals. Now, if you've been in biochemistry, I don't want you to get hives when you see this next slide. But this is the, this is the Krebs cycle. And this question that is in that uh, little thing that I just read has tormented biochemistry students for generations. They always ask the question, can you convert fat to glucose? And directly to glucose. And the answer that you're supposed to give is no. Uh, and what the, the thinking is, back to beta oxidation again, the breakdown of fat, it takes two carbon compounds into acetyl-CoA. And if you radio label uh, uh, those carbon compounds and find out where they jump out of the Krebs cycle, you find out that one of them jumps out there and one of them jumps out there. So you can't possibly get those around to oxaloacetate and recreate that. And so the answer is no, you can't feed it in through there and get it there. But is the answer really no? Not really. And I want to switch gears just for a second. These are the fuel reserves, because we'll get back to this other in a minute, but these are the fuel reserves available in a 70, the, the famous 70 <coughs> kilogram male, Jesus. Uh, the famous 70 kilogram male. Now this is just a chart, so it's hard to see, but if you look at it uh, graphically like this and you see the blood, there's very little of anything, very little anything in the liver or the brain. The muscle's got a lot of protein that's available for fuel and the adipose tissue, of course, has got a lot of fat. And if you just look at it broken down by fat, protein, and I mean, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, you see this giant wad of fat and you see the protein and then you see a very small amount of, of glucose over there. And would it make sense to design a system where this is the fuel, this big giant column of yellow fat, where that's the fuel and yet you couldn't get to it without destroying your muscle, which is what they say. I mean, Paleolithic man had to have his muscle to chase down musk oxes or whatever. Uh, so you had to be able to convert this to uh, glucose even if you weren't taking in any glucose. Now part of this fat is glycerol, and glycerol, when the, when the fats come out of the fat cells, the fatty acids break off and the glycerol is freed up and, and the freed up glycerol goes into gluconeogenesis. So that's one way to do it, but there are a couple of other ways too. In fact, there are a bunch of other ways. But this is the guy that I was telling you about earlier. This is a guy named Sam Legg, and Sam Legg was a conscientious objector in World War II, and he was working for the Civilian Conservation Corps. And he decided that he was going to volunteer to go into Ansel Keys, Minnesota starvation study. And what that meant was he was going to be locked away in the basement of the Minnesota stadium where the Gophers played, locked away down there for 24 weeks on a starvation diet. Now this starvation diet was about 1600 calories. So it's not you know, like 800 calories or anything, it's 1600 calories. And the majority of it was carbohydrate. It was about 230, 240 grams of carbohydrate. Look at what Sam looked like in uh, 24 weeks. And Sam's case was not unique. All, all the guys looked like this. And they were all young and healthy going in. So you can see that he lost lean body mass and he lost fat. And it's because he actually was on a ketogenic diet too because his calories were so restricted. So, I apologize for this slide, I couldn't get it big enough, but this is just one way that somebody showed in, in 1986, it's energetically positive. In other words, uh, the thing's going downhill, you don't have to overcome energy barriers to get from uh, acetoacetate through to acetone, run on, down to, run on down to pyruvate, over to oxaloacetate, and back to glucose. And because you can't see it, I kind of wrote it down on the right. But that's just one pathway that you can get from fat because uh, acetoacetate is a, is a ketone. So the fat goes into the acetyl-CoA pool, comes out as a ketone, and then can be regenerated as glucose. Here's a, an article uh, that was 2011 where these guys went through and, and did a computer analysis of all these metabolic pathways and they found 22 of them that energetically could convert fat to glucose. 
Here's one that was done in 1979. I like this one because this guy injected radio-labeled acetone into, into fasting humans. And what he ends up saying is radioactivity from the C4 acetone was present in plasma, glucose, lipids, and proteins. Glucose synthesis from acetone is possible in humans, which I found that really strange because this was a human study. But anyway, uh, maybe the... Maybe the peer review made him put it in, I don't know. Anyway, this process could account for 11% of the glucose production rate, 11% of the glucose in these people and some of these subjects came from acetone. So you can definitely do it. This was in 1979 and the textbook are still saying, you can't make it from fat, you can't make it from fat because they're just focusing on that one pathway. Now, you probably didn't want to see that slide again. Uh, <laughs> But here we are all set up with our ketones, and let's look and see what happens, what happens in actuality. Here's your acetyl-CoA pool. You're making the ketones, uh, ketones, one of which is acetone. Uh, acetone can convert to oxaloacetate. Acetone can convert to pyruvate. Pyruvate can convert there, and acetone can convert to glucose. So fat and acetone actually can convert to acetyl, can go into acetyl-CoA. So fat burns in the flame of fat, too. It burns in the flame of carbohydrate. It burns in the flame of proteins. Remember how we used, you saw that the protein got into the Krebs cycle uh, and, and got, uh, the protein actually converted to OAA and got into the Krebs cycle. So you could say that fat burns in the flame of amino acids and now it actually burns in the flame of fat. So this is what I have to say about the whole thing is that, you know, Thank God biochemistry textbooks writers weren't in charge of evolution. <laughs> or, or we would have been in a world of hurt. <laughs> and this guy kind of sums it up. This is Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who's got one of my favorite quotes, which is that the three uh, most terrible addictions are heroin, carbohydrates, and a monthly salary. But he has another <laughs> He has another one that I think is appropriate to what I'm talking about right now. And it says, the problem of knowledge is that there are many more books on birds written by ornithologists than books on birds written by birds. <laughs> and I say the same thing. There, there are a lot more books on ketosis written by biochemists that have no experience whatsoever with ketogenic diets. There need to be more books by biochemists with experience in ketogenic diets. So thank you very much.